Welcome to Farming for Health, where Farmer Lee Jones and I talk with leaders in food, farming, and health and wellness to spread knowledge and inspire a plant-forward future, starting now. Welcome to the Farming for Health podcast. I'm Dr. Amy Sapola, and I have the pleasure of being joined by Don Perry today, cookbook author of the book Ready, Set, Cook. Welcome, Don. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk with you about all things kind of simple, approachable cooking today. Um, and But first, just wanted to ask you, how did you come to write this book? What was your journey? Sure. So... So I spent about 15 years in food media. So working in test kitchens, developing recipes, um, really focused on um, recipes for for busy working people, largely busy working parents. Um, And, you know, I I talk about the book, like it's both, um, it's the book I wish I had sort of when I was like dumped out into the world in my early twenties. Um, and the book I, I need now as like a working parent of two young kids. Um, you know, my mom doesn't like to cook. She admits that openly. Um, and so like she fed us every night and like we ate really well growing up, but, but we didn't have like, I don't know. I didn't come out of, of college with like a great toolkit of like, here are my go-to recipes. And like, here's how I roasted chicken. Um, so I was living in San Francisco right out of college and, um, you know, everyone is so food obsessed there and for good reason, you have access to so much amazing, um, produce and, um, local ingredients. So I really like kind of like caught the bug there and ended up going to culinary school, but it really wasn't until I went to culinary school that I, that I started to learn how to cook. Um, and then, yeah, through, through all these years kind of developing recipes, I think, you know, there was a time where I think when you're trying to, to make things sound appealing for families and stuff, you're like, melt cheese on it, like serve a side of bacon. And then finally now having two young kids and it's like, well, it's great, but like there are, there are other solutions out there. So, um, I tried to approach it, um, with sort of myself in mind, with my community in mind, and really wanted to make a book that they could use day in and day out and turn to, to just like make dinner happen easily, quickly, um, and low stress. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I so relate to that. (laughs) I feel like, you know, I had a similar upbringing where my mom says she loved to cook early until we were the picky kids who didn't want to eat what she cooked. And then she's like, and then I kind of like, gave up a little bit you know yeah. and so um I think we I didn't come out like loving cooking and so I think that's amazing and you know I I also think looking at things for kids other than like the staples I said I was <laughs> this weekend I don't know why I've never noticed it before but I said I was offended by my microwave like on the buttons it says the little fast button says kids meals and it's hot dog mac and cheese or like (laughs) chicken tenders or something like three things and I'm like kids can eat more than these three things and so um I love the idea of it's more than just adding cheese to something right yeah um when it comes to your philosophy around cooking in general and then more specifically vegetables what do you what's like your general philosophy Um, I think as far as cooking goes, um, I really do try to make it easy and approachable for people. Mm -hmm. Um, One thing that that took some sort of like rewiring um, through my work life was that not everyone is food obsessed and not everyone loves to cook. Like I love food. I love to cook. I love going to the market. I love seeking out you know, unique or hard to find ingredients, but like, that's not everybody. And when I think of my mom, it's like she wanted to be like outside working in the yard, working with her horses, like that kind of thing. So um, I always want to keep that in mind that, mm-hmm. that when you're, when I was working with people who were all like, so into cooking and so invested in it, they're like, that's not, that's not who we're writing these recipes for. Mm-hmm. Um, So I really want to keep that in mind. And so so how do, how do I offer something to people um, that is really actionable, 
that they can complete and feel more confident. Um, because I do think the more, the more confident people become cooking, um, the more they want to do it, then the more invested they become and curious they become about the ingredients they're using. They start seeking out local ingredients. They start turning to their farmer's markets. And like, that's how we slowly make those changes mm -hmm. and get people kind of thinking locally, thinking seasonally, but you can't just kind of like drape that dogma over everyone. You really have to meet them where they are. So that's my approach. But like, I have these sort of like lofty goals for it. Um, I'm just trying to like meet people where they are and wiggle in to make it comfortable. Yeah, I love that approach. And I think that's so practical because there are quite a few people who aren't interested. Um, but if you can meet them, even with that one thing, sometimes it's that one tip or that one like easy solution um, that can lure you into maybe cooking a little bit more, trying something new. Yeah, I also think like it can be overwhelming to to think about cooking from like a whole meals perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so the the middle section of my book is all about how to build a homemade pantry. And it's not like you got to have these 36 things to execute these meals. It's like make a couple of things like make a salad dressing, maybe make like some toasted nuts. And like even those two things will like drastically improve whatever is in your regular rotation. So um, again, just kind of like breaking it down into into actionable parts is another thing to think about. I love the idea of kind of the staples in a pantry. And that's something I've actually been talking about with a couple of other people as well lately and writing about like in my own work. What do you like when it comes to making a great pantry? Do you have like one or two top tips? I do think, you know, relying on great store-bought ingredients, mm -hmm. I think is, is what makes sense for most people. Um, a, a good olive oil goes a long way. And like flaky salt goes a long way. <laughs> and it means it's like that final flourish that makes you feel, you know, like you did something. I always refer to the um, the Rice Krispie Treats commercial from the 80s where like the woman is, she's, she's reading a romance novel in the kitchen and you can hear the family on the other side of the kitchen door being like, mom, are they ready yet? And she's like, just a second. And like the Rice Krispie Treats are like clearly finished. <laughs> And she like closes the book and like she's had this moment to herself and she splashes the water on her face and like dust flour and then she you know comes out of the kitchen and it's like you know she's she's created this incredible thing so it like gives you that feeling of like look what i've done when it was really just you know like seasoning yeah a, a nice a nice piece of fish or something um so I think leaning on on those things, I think you don't need to have a lot of ingredients, just the right ingredients. Mm -hmm. And you also have to be honest about what those are for you and your family. So I think a lot of times we look at magazines or websites, we think like, oh, like I'm gonna get all that person's stuff. And then you realize like, I don't really like tinned fish or whatever it is. <laughs> right. And so I think just evaluating any of those suggestions, you know, through your own lens, um, is is the way to do it um and then as far as homemade staples go i think it really is like pick one or two um and start there and i think that was sort of another inspiration for the book is working in test kitchens you know come friday we'd always clean out the fridge clean out the pantry and so we'd all go home with these bits and pieces whether it was like, oh, there's this amazing pesto or like a little bit of these cooked grains. And so we kind of had the makings of a lot of great meals ready to go. So it's like, okay, can we think of this as sort of some assembly required mm -hmm. versus like, I got to start from scratch. So I think, um, you know, if you can, if you can think about it, like I'm going to shop my own, my own cupboards, my own fridge first. Um, I think you start to get more creative um, and more nimble. Yeah. Do you have any go-to tips or tricks around vegetables? Like when you're building your pantry or building what your refrigerator, right? Are there certain like staple vegetables that you try to keep on hand and certain tricks you have um, to utilize those? A note from our sponsor. 
Farmer Jones Farm provides nutritious, regeneratively grown vegetables to home cooks nationwide. We seek to provide our community with vegetables grown in a way that's healthy for you and good for the planet. To learn more about Farmer Jones Farm, visit FarmerJonesFarm.com. Yeah, so I, um, you know, it's true though, once you have kids, you, you kind of buy what, you know, they'll eat. Yeah. So we <laughs> always have carrots, we always have cucumbers, we always have snap peas or snow peas, sort of like regardless of the season. Um, though I do sort of like preach eating seasonally, it's, you know, what, what happens at my house um, is the real deal. So yeah. <laughs> um, we always have those cauliflower and broccoli. Um, I love to roast, everyone likes mm -hmm. that. So those longer lasting vegetables, I always have on hand. And parsley is another good one as far as um, uh, a way to freshen things up, but like it lasts a really long time all those vegetables will last a long time. And I keep those like in the crisper drawer. I have recently begun, and I stand by this, that I've seen a lot of companies selling opaque storage containers, like bowls with lids. And I'm like, yes. no, if I don't see it, I'm forgetting about it. So if, if you know, we get like, tender lettuces or a bunch of different herbs, things that are, are like slightly more perishable. I'll try and keep those at eye level. So mm -hmm. I remember to use them. Um, Cause it's true. Like as a busy person, you just kind of like, you know, if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. So that is like a new tip for myself that I suggest to people. So clear storage containers, keep anything more perishable at eye level so you can see it or labeled really clearly so you can see it. But like I'm often, lazy about labeling, even though, again, I do tell people to like, you know, Sharpie <laughs> all their stuff, but, um, but those are sort of like the, that's like the secret. Yeah. <laughs> well, house. I love that tip. And I saw a study not too long ago about that, that if you put, um, like vegetables or fruit stored in clear containers, they're consumed more readily than if you put them in opaque containers. And so even yeah. like for kids and snacks, like being able to reach in the refrigerator and see, cut up vegetables and grab them and eat them. It's a lot different than having to figure out what's in each opaque container. Yes. So. Yes. And even, and that's the only hard thing because I do try and take care of my greens and herbs by like mm -hmm. washing and drying and then wrapping lightly in paper towels, but I, but I will forget. So those are the kinds of things I try and keep out, you know, labeled so I can remember like, oh, right, that's cilantro mm -hmm. and kale versus you know, whatever it is, chives and mint. But, um, but yeah, I think it makes a huge difference. Yeah. And I know your cookbook is really centered on kind of like um, quicker, easy approaches to cooking. When it comes to vegetables, how, what's like your like philosophy for incorporating them into the meals um, in kind of like a simple way? I do. I love to roast stuff. Mm -hmm. Um and it tastes good, it's hands off. You can do it with so many different types of vegetables from like green beans, which I think people often just think about like blanching or steaming, but like those are really good roasted to some of the hardier stuff like Brussels sprouts, broccoli, um, and some of the other crucifers. So I will often make a big batch of that, of, mm -hmm. of something roasted on Sunday or something. I'm not, I'm not big on meal planning or meal prep. I talk about that in the book just because I feel like oftentimes if I make a plan to make something on Wednesday, like Wednesday comes and like, I don't want that. I want something mm -hmm. else. But if I sort of prep these parts, then I can incorporate them. So vegetables, roasting vegetables is a great way to do that. So I'll roast a couple of those things, even like a tray of onions roasted is oh, yeah. awesome to have around so you can stir it through rice put it on a salad even like add it to soups or something that you have around serve it on the side um so especially with kids sort of you know like pulling some of that stuff out yeah. um can really work so that's the thing i love to do and then how I've do you trying... roast your onions tell me about that like are you cutting sure. them up and roasting them do you roast them yeah. whole wedges uh -huh. so have lengthwise probably like in eighths you know eighth to sixteenth I don't you know not like too prescriptive about it so yeah. like half inch wedges ish plenty of olive oil toss 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 salt and pepper roast like 
400, 425 um, for probably like 25 minutes. Oh, nice. And, and then you have just this sort of like sweet and savory complex flavor that you can add to anything. Do you have a favorite onion variety that you like to use? Not really. I mean, I always have yellow and red onions around. Yeah. Um, and, but like, I love to throw scallions or green onions on the grill. Um, I'm lucky to live in California where we can grill year yeah. round. Um, but no, I mean, I, sort of, I never met an onion I didn't like. Um, <laughs> I would say, but I do, I find myself sort of gravitating towards, you know, kind of the more standard ones be, just because they're easy to peel. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. I love, yeah, I love shallots, but like anytime I have to deal with like more than two, I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> like this is going to take too long. <laughs> That's, I was wondering too, like, when it comes to food waste, like talking about onion skins and, you know, putting things where you can see them so that you're not wasting them. Do you have a few like tricks around having a well-stocked pantry, but also minimizing food waste? Yeah. I think those clear containers are sort of my biggest tip. Yeah. So that plus the being honest with yourself Mm -hmm. about what you and your family will eat. Like those are my two biggest ones. Um, I did like a, we had like a really big shopping day yesterday. We went to the farmer's market, got like a ton of amazing produce. We also went to the grocery store to get like some proteins. Um, But like one thing I love to buy is frozen shrimp. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like really utilize my freezer. So I, I often think like, I know I want to have these things around, especially like in the protein department, like chicken breasts, Um, We got a couple of pork chops, shrimp we got yesterday, and then I got a piece of salmon. So it's like, okay, the salmon we had last night, the other stuff I popped in the freezer, I don't have to worry about, you know, watching the clock. Like, okay, we got to make this by Wednesday. I could pull it out the morning of or the night before. um, And that sort of reduces that stress. Um, And then produce-wise, that's the hard thing because, like, I do get excited and inspired Um, even just in the grocery store, like in front of all the greens and stuff, I think of all the things I can make. Um, but there's lots of ways to repurpose stuff. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself with like wilty celery or, you know, like these herbs or greens are about to go. So there's a lot of solutions in my book about how to deal with that. Pickling is so easy. You can pickle a ton of stuff. Um, and I, I don't tend to like you know, do like true preserving. I just make, Mm -hmm. you know, refrigerator pickles. Um, So super simple brine of vinegar, water, some spices, salt and sugar, and you can save cucumbers, um, like shard stems, celery, all these types of things, radishes, beets, all these things that um, you can sort of give a second life to if you have forgotten it. I love to make like green sauces and pestos that you can use like any herbs, any tender greens. Um, So I think it's sort of like shopping with an open, with an open heart, like, you know, clear eyes and an open heart about like, okay, what are we actually going to get through? Um, And if not, like, am I prepared to go to plan B? Um, And then just, you know, keeping it in a place where you're reminded that you have it. Um, beyond just storing stuff properly, you know, like onions and potatoes mm-hmm. and like a cool dry place. Otherwise, you know, your, your fresher, more perishable stuff in the refrigerator. Um, but, but those are sort of my, my big tips. Yeah. And I know you said you're more like ingredient prep versus meal prep. Yes. Are you like team shopping list or no shopping list? I do. Well, I always go with the list and then I always mm-hmm. go off script. <laughs> so Um, And my husband and I joke about like, what, what surprises did we get this time? (laughs) Um, So I always go with a list just to make sure I have the staples that I use all the time um, that, that make it into the cart. But then like, I allow myself to, to, you know, be inspired and and get what I see. Um, I still like grocery shopping, even though like I've done it for work for so long. Um, I think, I think it's so cool to see um, 
both, you know, um, produce wise things that sort of like become in vogue and, and are more readily available. And even like, I remember before quinoa, like I remember when that like came on the scene yes. and now it's sort of like, obviously quinoa and, you know, is, is part of, part of so many people's pantries. So I love to kind of watch those things make inroads. Um, and I just, you know, my husband and I, for a time, we had a, a direct to consumer cookie company <laughs> and um, I am so inspired by it now sort of knowing kind of what it takes to, to get something off the ground, to make something less perishable. <laughs> so like, you know, it can survive shipping or sit on the shelf in a way that's still delicious, um, and responsible. Like I'm, I'm super inspired to see those products kind of hit shelves. So, um, so yeah, so team list but you can throw out the list if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of share that. I feel the same way. I enjoy grocery shopping too, but I do. I love looking for all the like unique things or like what's new, what's local, you know, and yeah, yeah it's hard to plan for that on a list. So yeah. <laughs> um, when it comes to like cooking with creativity and, you know, being creative with what you have on hand. I know you talked about like sometimes it's looking at what's in your refrigerator or what's left over in the test kitchen refrigerator and being able to like come up with a great meal. For someone who maybe isn't super comfortable with cooking or just doesn't even know where to start, where would you where would you tell them to like start with that sort of approach? I really I I've considered it's not even like a second book. It's like, I don't know, it's like a, it's like a quarterly or something just called make one thing. Um, and back to that idea of sort of like, you can look at a recipe that has like a protein, a starch, a side, and like a thing on top. It's like, whoa, that's like a lot of pots and pans. Like that's a lot of in, invested time and energy. Um, so I think, you know, start with whatever's in your regular rotation. You know, like if you guys love grilled chicken, if you love a salad, you know, stick with that and then change it up with sort of one homemade thing, whether that's a salad dressing, you know, a toasted seed sprinkle, um, a new roasted vegetable, and sort of just incorporate it into sort of what's already um, easy and accessible for you. And then that will kind of start to, to get those creative juices flowing. It's like, okay, like that was great. And even if you just incorporate it into that same meal, that feels like a win to me. Um, or it will inspire you like, oh, like it was great with the tofu steaks. Like I bet it would be great alongside beans or whatever other thing is in your rotation. So I think it's it's just like starting mm -hmm. um, to and, and trying, but doing it in these smaller chunks. So it, you don't think like, ah, I can't do it. You know, so it's like, okay, I'm just going to make the zing sauce. I'm just going to make the relish, keep it on hand and see, play with it through the week and see what I like it on. Yeah. Oh, that's great. What's one of your favorite like time time saving tricks that you've learned maybe most recently? Well, I will say speaking of the microwave, I for a long time did not have the mic have a microwave. I didn't either. I refused. And this house we have has one built in, so now I'm required to have a microwave, but I'd like to get yeah. rid of it. But yes, please go ahead. <laughs> We didn't have a microwave yeah. for so long. And I remember a friend of mine who also works in food, she was like, but how do you reheat your coffee or your kids' food? And I was like, I drink the coffee too fast. And like, <laughs> you know, I just like reheat it in a pot. But then as soon as you get the microwave and you realize how easy that is, um, you start to use it. So I'd say like steaming vegetables in the microwave is, is a great hands-off trick. So it's like, you know, microwave safe bowl, little bit of water, whatever the veg is, season with salt, cover with, and I don't even use plastic wrap. Sometimes I'll just like put a plate on it, kind of a oh, stew. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and steam it. And then it's done. I feel like those dishes I can put in the dishwasher versus mm -hmm. like the pot, which I feel pressure to hand wash. <laughs> um, so that is something I've started to lean on 
um, I think that's recently. a great trick. And that's also very, like, does save a ton of time. And that's the yeah. one very nice thing about it. We definitely still use ours. But yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about that the, just today, actually, about the steamer basket to steam, like, that you have to boil the water and get the steamer basket and, you know, all the things. And I was thinking about it because I don't know where a steamer basket is. Yeah. And <laughs> so I think that's a great trick. A message from our sponsor. The Chef's Garden is a family-owned regenerative farm that grows the most flavorful and nutritious vegetables, herbs, and microgreens for culinary professionals and home cooks. For over 30 years, the Chef's Garden has supplied some of the world's finest chefs and restaurants. Now, through Farmer Jones Farm, the same delicious ingredients are available to home cooks in the United States to use and enjoy, delivered directly to their homes. The Chef's Garden mission is to grow exceptional vegetables, care for each other in the land, and to inspire a vegetable-forward future. For more information, visit chefs-garden.com. If you had, like, say, Brussels sprouts, sweet potatoes, and, like, celery root in your fridge, maybe they're already roasted, what would you make? Like, what, what would come to mind as far as, like, what you could create? I would probably roast them all. Mm-hmm. and then toss them with like some kind of cooked grain um i cooked some farro yesterday just to oh, have yeah down. so toss them with farro and maybe like i would maybe pickle a raisin Ooh. um so you get like a little bit of sweet a little bit of tangy like a little bit of heat i'll put some chili in there Yum. um so like toss some of the pickled raisins in there olive oil maybe like toasted pistachios or something yeah um and like chopped herbs if i had them so i'd like toss it all up keep it in the fridge and like that could be my lunch for a few days so oh my gosh that sounds so good (laughs) (laughs) that's like the best answer tell me about pickled raisins that's new to me pickled raisins are so good and i i first made them to go with um, a duck confit recipe that I developed years ago. So they're great sort of in that context when you have something sort of really rich, whether it's animal protein or, or even like a cheese or cheesy dish or something. Um, The sweet is a really nice balance, but also that acid is so nice to cut through richer, richer items. Um, And you just do it like you would do another, another pickle. So, um, I, like a hot brine tends to work better with raisins because they'll plump up a bit. So you just, you know, heat, heat vinegar. I always sort of do like the laws of displacement test. So like put some raisins in a jar, fill it up with water, measure that how much, and then do half vinegar, half water of that amount. Big pinch of sugar, big pinch of salt, whatever kind of like whole dry um, spices you have. So I like to like crack some coriander or fennel seed, um, several grinds of black pepper, maybe some chili flake, heat up the brine, pour it over the raisins, close them up, let them cool, and then you're good. And just stick them in the fridge and they'll last forever. That sounds so good. Yeah. That's amazing. (laughs) I think I'm going to have to make that. (laughs) And works with lots of other dried fruit. So like you could chop up apricots and do it. Currants are really good pickled. Um, mulberries which i think there may be if there's not a picture of pickled mulberries in the book there was maybe in the book proposal because i I got a lot of people being like what's that (laughs) so i was like well i had them around you know so again it's another way to like breathe a second life into into some things that you may think like should i get rid of this it's like oh i'll try to pickle it and see if i can and i don't necessarily think of that with dried fruit it's kind of neat to think that you can plump it back up and give it that flavor and then add like a different texture yeah um that is so cool i love mulberries so much by the way i have a mulberry tree in wisconsin and fresh mulberries are so good so So yeah we like the dried ones too but yeah um Good. All right. So our podcast is called Farming for Health. And when you hear Farming for Health, health, what does that um, mean to you? Or what does that bring up for you? So um, I grew up, uh, my mom had a farm. So we had a couple of horses, just like a little bit of land, but spent a lot of time in sort of um, more agricultural area growing up. And so had always had an awareness that, that people were making a living 
um, growing food. And that's always sort of been like on the, in the back of my mind, sometimes in the front. Um, and I think especially sort of in the last decade or so, learning more about sort of like soil health um, mm -hmm. and the impact of sort of more responsible farming techniques. Um, it, it makes you want to make better choices um, and, and sort of get to know where your food is coming from. Which, which can be super overwhelming. Um, but but it's, it's like what we have to do and what we have to start thinking about. Um, and again, I think if we can just sort of tease out that idea for people in a way that doesn't feel like in, an insurmountable um, issue, then, then we can really make a lot of progress. So, um, I grew up, you know, like with my hands in the dirt, getting dirt. I know how good it feels to, to, you know, work in a yard, grow tomatoes, grow mint, you know, like even if it's just like a couple small things, um, I think it's certainly better for the planet, but it's also like, it feels really good. I remember um, I used to work as a private chef a hundred years ago. And I remember um, talking to, to someone who, and there was a, a kid around, she was say 10 or something. And we were sort of talking about working in the garden and, and sort of explaining like how good that feels when you, you know, like pick the blueberries, pick an apple, like cut the lettuce. And she was like, oh, like when we go clamming and she like instantly got it. It's like when you go out there and, mm -hmm. and, you know, harvest whatever it is yourself, like you already tap into this like holistic approach um, to feeding, to eating um, and to procuring your food. So um, I wish I had a better growing spot at my house. Currently, <laughs> We have like one little raised bed. Um, we live quite close to the ocean. So I think the salt is affecting my ability to, to farm my own, I'm using air quotes to like farm my own food, but we have like a little bit of trouble. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's, you know, as big and as small as, as you want to want to make it, but I think, you know, farming for health, it's, it's, um, it's an amazing goal. And, and again, I think the more we can especially expose our kids mm -hmm. to that, to that process, um, you know, the more informed their choice of choices will be and they won't even realize it. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you bring up kids. What it, when it comes to kids in the kitchen, do you have any tips or tricks that you've learned from your own kids is coming into the kitchen? Yes. I would say, I would say don't rush it. <laughs> I think that was yeah. maybe one of my, challenges is like I tried to like get them on the step stool a little too early um where you know I was feeling I was like maybe trying to control the situation too much and it's like just let them it, or maybe that's the tip it's just sort of like abandon this illusion of control just like let them crack the eggs in their hand you know like just let them like mix. You can have your own batter to the side that will become the banana bread. Just like let them do their thing. Um, but I've actually learned a ton from my kids' school. They do a ton of baking um, and a ton of cooking there. And they, one of the coolest things they do is like everybody gets their own bowl and all of the ingredients are in the middle. So it's like that's that stuff in the middle is measured out. And so everybody gets to take a little bit of each ingredient and mix it up in their own bowl. And then it all goes back into one big bowl. Um, so everyone has a chance to really incorporate the ingredients and there's no stress about like, what went in? Did we measure it right? So like, there's a little bit of prep involved. Um, but I would say my kids are three and five now and they can do far more I mean, obviously, <laughs> than they could, <laughs> than they could two years ago, um, and it's way more fun. So I think you know, like, don't don't stress if you feel like oh, it's not working or like it's too chaotic. It was like very chaotic because <laughs> my kids are very high energy, um, but like there will come a time 
when they can, you know, like have calm bodies at the, at the yes. counter. Um, and, and they can really like help in a way that they feel is, is like fun and, and you know, like makes a difference in the, mm-hmm. in the meal. Um, but, you know, we do a lot of like dipping pretzels in melted chocolate, you know, yeah. so, like, even like little tasks like that to, to remind them that like, it's really fun in here. Mm-hmm. Um, I think are, are good activities. Oh, I think that's great. Do you have a favorite vegetable forward, like family meal right now? Um, well, we do almost once a week, like a tofu bowl situation. Oh, nice. So everybody really loves, I, I sort of cut tofu in squares, press it to, to get some of the moisture out and then dip it in soy sauce and pan fry it. And so that's sort of like the main, and then we usually have it on like rice or something with something pickled. So like usually cucumbers, because everybody mm-hmm. likes those, and something roasted. Yes. Um, and and then there's like a sauce or something that's usually in the fridge. Or if not, if it's not homemade, you know, like we really love chili oil and spicy stuff. So like we'll drizzle that on. But it's a great way for my husband and I to sort of like customize what we want. We can separate the stuff so my kids get, you know, they're a little bit of both vegetable, the tofu that they like, rice sometimes go, goes over, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> um, but we do that once a week and like everybody loves it. Oh, that sounds delicious. What a great idea. And I love yeah. where you can kind of build your own and everybody can pick and choose what they like in their bowl. So yeah, that's really fun. So I know our listeners are going to want to connect with you. Where can they find you online? So um, I've been sort of light on social lately, but you can definitely find me on Instagram at Dawn K. Perry. Um, and there's lots of recipes of mine on the internet um, that you can Google. So if you if you just Google Don Perry, you should find a lot of good stuff, but please reach out. I'm always happy to answer questions in the DMs. Um, My email address is pretty easy to find as well. Um, So do reach out. I love to hear from home cooks about um, how they're cooking, what they're cooking, what they love about the book, what they love about other recipes. Um, And I, I know that, you know, every kitchen is different. Everybody's equipment is different. So if you ever have um, questions about that, I'm happy to answer those too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being a guest. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Thank you for listening to Farming for Health. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Connect with Farmer Lee Jones and I on Instagram and Facebook.